Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The Adventures of Superman. When the planet Krypton, home of a race of supermen, exploded into dust, the sole survivor was an infant boy who had been shot to earth in a sealed rocket. Today, that boy, grown to manhood, is known as Superman, sworn enemy of the forces of evil. To aid him in his never-ending fight for truth and justice, he masquerades as Clark Kent, crime reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. His secret is carefully guarded. No one is aware that Kent is Superman. No one but you. <laughs> Join with us now on ABC as Superman prevents a brutal murder and solves a baffling mystery in an exciting transcribed adventure entitled The Voices of the Dead. In his never-ending quest for knowledge, man has dug deep into the long-buried secrets of the past. On the walls of crumbling caves, he has found crude picture writing. In the dead cities of Persia and Assyria, in the dark and musty tombs of ancient pharaohs, he has discovered curiously shaped letters and words. Back through the centuries, man has traced the written language. But what of the spoken tongue? Are the voices of Caesar, Socrates, Alexander, yes, even Lincoln, lost to us forever? Is there no way of bringing them back from the dim and distant past? Perhaps there is. Listen to the voices of the dead. We're seen as the crack express the Golden Comet speeding through the night toward the city of Metropolis. Clark Kent and Lois Lane, who boarded the train at its last stop, are about to enter the dining car. Careful on the platform, Lois. It's really rolling now. You're not kidding. In you go. Thanks. I hope we find him here in the diner, Clark. If we don't, we've certainly wasted an awful lot of time. Good evening, sir, too. No, we've had dinner, thank you. We're looking for some. I see. I don't see him, Clark. Do you? Oh, I'm looking. There he is. Where? On the left, at the end of the car. Got his back to us. You can tell him from his mop of white hair. Oh, I see him. Who's the woman with him? I don't know. Maybe his daughter. Come on. Please. No, excuse oh, me. I'm oh, I'm sorry. Oh, right. Not so fast, Clark. I'll fall into somebody's suit. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Quite all right. Hard to keep your balance going around those curves. Certainly is, isn't it? Okay, Lois. Here it goes. Dr. Roebling? Uh, are you addressing me, young man? Yes, Doctor. I'm Clark Kent of the Metropolis Daily Planet. This is Miss Lane. How do you do? We understand you've perfected an amazing new electronic voice machine, and we wondered whether you'd spend a few minutes with us and tell us about it. Why, well, I'm sorry, young man, but I, I don't know what you're talking about. Aren't you Dr. Roebling of the Electronic Institute? Uh, no, no. You seem to have made a mistake. A mistake in... Identity. If you don't mind, we'd like to finish our dinner. I'm sorry. Terribly sorry. Let's go, Lois. Where to? The club car. Got to figure this out. There's something rotten in Denmark. You know, Clark, you could be wrong. Or isn't that possible? Yeah, it's possible, but not in this case. He's not Dr. Roebling. I'll eat my hat. Remember that. I'll remember it. You'd like to eat it with mayonnaise or without? That's not funny. Compartment E, car 22. Mm hmm? It's the compartment they went into after they left the dining car. Oh, relax, Clark. Enjoy the ride. It's on the expense account. And anyway, even if he is Dr. Roebling, I don't believe that voice machine story. Well, what don't you believe about it? Well, I don't believe anybody can build a machine capable of recreating voices of. Of, well, taking them right out of thin air. Where do you think atoms come from? Well, atoms aren't voices. No, but... Do you mean to sit there and tell me that with Dr. Robin's machine you can hear 
The voices of, of dead people? If it's what I think it is. Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> Your grandfather wouldn't have believed television. Your great-grandfather wouldn't have believed radio and the telephone and your well, great... Well, that's different. Why? I don't know why, but it is. Oh, it is. Clark, it, 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 it's just inconceivable that a person can sit down at a machine and let's say hear, uh, well, uh, uh, George Washington's voice or, or Thomas Jefferson's voice or anybody who's dead. When a person dies, his voice dies with him. Does it? Doesn't it? Well, not the words he spoke when he was alive. What do you mean? Look, you can hear me talk, Lois, right? Well, of course. Because the words that leave my mouth become sound waves that strike your ears and are translated into what we call speech. Sure, Clark, I know that. Okay, the same with radio waves. They travel through the air and are picked up by a, a radio receiver, which translates them into speech or music or what have you. Yes, but that still doesn't explain... Wait a minute. Now, if you were in the next car of this train and I tried to talk to you, you wouldn't hear me. That's a brilliant conclusion. But why wouldn't you hear me? I give up. Only because your receiving equipment, your ears, aren't sensitive enough. My sound waves would be in the next car, but you couldn't pick them up. Now, listen. Now, dogs, for instance, have far more sensitive hearing than humans. But all of which adds up to what? Isn't it Roebling evidently has invented a machine so sensitive that it can pick up and reproduce sound waves created years ago? Maybe even centuries ago. The voice of Washington saying farewell to his troops, Lincoln at Gettysburg. Sorry, I still don't believe it. Well, that's why the chief had us fly out to pick up this train, because it's important that we get to Roman. Well, we can't get to him if he's not on the train. You know, come to think of it, maybe he didn't want to talk in front of all those people in the dining car. Well, Clark, now what are you cooking up? Oh, look, we're, we're coming into Marsden City. As soon as we get rolling again, I'm going to take another stab at Roebling. How? Try to corner him in his compartment. Up away. That galley was where they're sure going to blow her top. She was pretty uppity in the dining car. If you don't mind, we'd like to finish our dinner. <laughs> I'm used to women blowing their tops. You've trained me. Whenever I blow mine, there's a good reason. No doubt. Now, oh, here we are. Compartment B. Great Scott. What's the matter? There's no one in there. How do you know? I can see through. I mean, well, there just is. Oh, now, Clark, stop it. You can't. The door's locked. But so what? Haven't people the right to leave their compartments if they feel like it? Or must they have your permission? You don't understand, Lois. These doors can only be locked from the inside, except by the conductor. Well, you better have nothing in that door, because here comes the conductor now. Oh, good. Now, please, don't make any wild things. Don't worry. Good evening. Good evening. I, I wonder, could you help me? I don't think I can. Uh, some friends of mine are in this compartment. The door's locked, and I can't seem to get any response. I wondered whether they could have gotten off at the last stop, Marsden City. Well, not if the door's locked. I carry the only key that'll lock or unlock these compartment doors from the outside. That's what I thought. You tried the buzzer? No, but I rattled the door. You try the buzzer on the left there. Okay. Well, there doesn't seem to be anyone in there. Well, there's got to be if the door's locked, mister. No? Some folks are hard sleepers, you know. I'm sure there's no one in that compartment. Well, try knocking. Sometimes the knock will wake them when the buzzer won't. Okay. Can you unlock the door? One of our friends is an elderly gentleman, and we're concerned about it. Well, I don't know. Unless it's an emergency, we don't usually unlock these doors. Well, let's try knocking once more. Well, it seems like that banging would wake the dead. You'd better use the key. I guess so. Well, it's the first time I've had to do this in ten years. Is anyone in there, Clark? No. And look at the window. Great day in the morning. What is it? The window pane is cut out with a glass cutter. You mean that's how they got off the train through the window? No other way. But why? Obviously to avoid being seen. You mean that old man and that woman climbed out of the window just to get away from us? Oh, no. No, there was another reason. And I'm going back to find out what it was. Back where? The last stop, Marsden City. You go on to the truck. But now listen. Tell the chief I'll call him if I dig up anything. So long, Lois. Clark, wait, Clark! Leaving Lois Lane and the Pullman conductor puzzled and confused, Clark Kent hurries to the observation platform at the rear of the train. In the darkness, he quickly removes his horn rimmed glasses and in a few moments makes a change from a mild mannered crime reporter to the heroic red and blue clad figure of Superman. <laughs> 
Then, leaping from the platform, the only human being he numbers among his other amazing powers, the power of flight, follows the gleaming railroad tracks back to the station at Marsden City. At the station, once more in his guise of Clark Kent, he steps up to the ticket window. Could you help me? Sir, there are no more trains out in here at night, mister. No, I'm not looking for a train. I'd like some information. Well, what can I do for you? The Golden Comet stopped here about ten minutes ago, didn't it? Yep, pulled in at 7.40, pulled out at 7.44. You didn't happen to see some people, an elderly man and a woman, get off the train? No, she had four or five pickups, uh, connections from the 6.50 to the west, but nobody got off except in a stretcher case. A what? Just one of them stretcher cases. Had an ambulance here to pick him up. Took him off the train through the window. Say that again. You hard of hearing, young fellow? No, no, no. I, I just want to make sure. You say an ambulance was here at the station to pick up a sick man who was taken off the train through a window? That's right. Didn't see him myself. Kind of I had to load the mail. Where'd the ambulance come from? Well, only one private ambulance outfit in town. Regan's. R-E-G-A-N? That's right. On the square, opposite the Marlboro Hotel. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry, mister, but we don't give out any information about patients we carry in our ambulances. That stuff's private and confidential, like it is with doctors. But don't you see, it's important that I locate Dr. Roebling. Who? Dr. Roebling, the elderly man you met at the train. Well, that wasn't his name, mister. Oh, what name did he use? Oh, no, that won't work. Say, who are you, anyway? My name's Kent. I'm with the Metropolis Daily Planet. Here, here are my credentials. Fire card, police card, etc. Well, I wish I could help you, Mr. Kent, but like I said, in our business, we don't talk. All we know is we got a call to meet the train to pick up a stretcher case. You got a name, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we got a name. But believe me, it's nothing like robing or rolling or whatever that was you said. Well, where did you take him? Well, we don't give that out either. Maybe he doesn't want to be disturbed. Maybe he's too sick to be bothered by reporters. Who knows? Was there a woman with him? Now, look, Mr. Kent, I... I'm just a guy who works for a living. Well, why should I stick my neck out? I see. Well, let's put it this way. Will $20 get me the answers to a couple of questions? Well, that depends on the questions. Okay. Let's try a few. Did you take Dr. Roebling, or the sick man, whatever name you got, to a hospital? No. But don't ask me where we took him. Fair enough. Question number two. Did the woman go with him? No. Well, we dropped her off. Where? You said a couple of questions. A couple, too. I'll add ten for the third. Where did you drop her off? At the Marlboro Hotel across the square. All right, now twenty more. That'll make it an even fifty for the name she gave you. No deal. I promise I won't reveal the source. Still no deal. Okay. Here's your thirty. Thanks. Uh... You going over at the hotel now? That's right. Well, the night clerk's name is Joe Hummel. You tell him Barney over at Regan said to help you out. They don't get many check-ins after 8 o'clock. He, he ought to remember Well, why are you telling me this after refusing to give me her name for an extra $20? Well, a guy's got to have some ethics, don't he? <laughs> I can see your point. Thanks. <laughs> Crossing the square, Clark Kent enters the almost deserted lobby of the Marlboro Hotel. A few moments of conversation with the night clerk, and he has the information he wants. Stepping into an elevator, he gets off at the ninth floor. Let's see, 911. That's to the left. <laughs> Moving silently along the carpeted corridor, he stops before the door of room 911. His hand is raised, and he is about to knock when suddenly his eyes widen and the color drains from his face. Great Scott! What has Kent, making use of Superman's X-ray vision, seen behind the door of room 911? We'll be back in a moment to find out. But first, here is your ABC announcer. Most of us aren't content to just sit back and think about a desperate situation. We want to know what we can do about it. And right now, America faces a desperate crisis in its public school system. 
There's been a sharp rise in the enrollment in our elementary schools without sufficient teachers to handle the new enrollments. And this is a situation which experts predict will continue for at least the next seven years. What can we do about it? Well, here's the best way. Learn how you can work in your own community. To help you, a new commission has just been formed to study conditions in schools. The National Citizens Commission for the Public Schools is composed of prominent men to help transform interest in the school situation to action. Currently, they're telling citizens how to work to improve their local schools. If you're interested in assisting them, write for information. And here's the address. National Citizens Commission for Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York, New York. And now, back to the adventures of Superman and part two of The Voices of the Dead. What started as a routine assignment to interview Dr. Walter Roebling, a famous electronic scientist, has turned into a strange and baffling mystery. Facing the woman who was with Dr. Roebling aboard a metropolis-bound train to room 911 at the Marlboro Hotel in Marsden City, Clark Kent was about to knock at the door when suddenly he blanked. Great Scott! Who is it? Bellboy. What do you want? I have a telegram for you, miss. Oh, just a minute. Why, Clark. Yes, is that all you've got to say, Miss Lane? Is that all I've got to say? I left you on a train headed for Metropolis. How did you get off the train, and what are you doing here in someone else's hotel room? Well, I might ask you exactly the same question. Uh, won't you come in? No, and you'd better get out of that room before Mrs. Smith returns and catches you red-handed. Oh, so you know about Mrs. Smith, too. Yes. Well, how cozy. Isn't it? Well, I'm through in here anyway, so we'll just close the door, lock up, and return the key to the desk. How did you get the key? Asked for it at the desk coming. Now, Lois, don't get smart. Maybe if you didn't try to get so smart, things like this wouldn't happen. And maybe if you hadn't rushed off like a madman without any explanation whatsoever, you wouldn't have had to jump off a moving train. I assume that's what you did, and walk back to Marsden City. How did you get back, and how did you get off the train, and why? Well, I'll answer the last question first. I found a telegram in that compartment. Here. Read it. This is Cora Smith, compartment E, Golden Comet, en route Metropolis. Ambulance will be waiting Marsden City with full instructions. You are registered Hotel Marlboro, room 911. Wait there for my call, Jack. Does that answer one question? How did you get off the train? Talked the conductor into stopping at a way station. I made a call from a general store and got a taxi to drive me back to Marsden City for $10. When I reached the hotel, I walked up to the desk, asked for the key to 911, and got it. You took an awful chance. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. What did you find in the room? Something that might be interesting. Oh, what? Mrs. Smith evidently got her call from Jack. No. She wrote an address down on a piece of paper, but she was probably in an awful hurry and forgot it. What is it? 218 Vanderveer Street. I'll check it. Oh, no, you won't. You're not ducking out on me again, Clark Kent. If there's a story here and it looks like there is, I'm in on it. Okay, let's go. Linking her arm in Kent, Lois Lane starts down the corridor toward the bank of elevators. Meanwhile, in the second-floor room of a dilapidated boarding house at 218 Vanderveer Street, a strange scene is taking place. The elderly, white-haired man, Kent identified as Dr. Walter Roebling, is bound to a chair in the center of the room. Facing him is a man with small, close-set eyes and a sallow, unhealthy complexion. And standing beside him is the woman, the mysterious Mrs. Smith, who was Dr. Roebling's companion on the train. The sallow-complected man has a sheaf of papers in one hand and a fountain pen in the other. Are you going to sign these papers, Uncle Walter? Or do I have to try a little persuasion? The voice machine cannot be used for private profit. Belongs to the public, to all the people. Don't give me that holier-than-thou stuff. It belongs to me. I'm your nephew, your only living relative. You're an old man. You're going to die soon. Now sign these papers before I lose my temper. Take it easy, Oh, shut up! I know what I'm doing. Even your wife, who has no blood ties with me, revolts against your dishonesty. You old f- <coughs> Now, you got anything more to say, Uncle Walter? You didn't have to hit him. I know what I have to do. I'll kill him unless he comes across. I'll get that voice machine one way or the other. Did you hear that, Uncle Walter? Yes, Jack, I heard it. All right, then. Fine. Put your signature on these papers and we'll leave you alone. We won't bother you again. I'm not concerned about myself. 
As you said a moment ago, I'm an old man. I haven't long to live. It's you, Jack. What about me? You're my dead brother's son. I held you in my arms as an infant. You sat on my knee as a child, and I read you stories. I watched you grow and mature. Oh, cut out the sob stuff. And now, without sense or feeling, you stand there and threaten to kill me. It's more than just a threat. You sign or you never leave this room alive. I'll sign. Good. Good. Come on. Free his hand. But right. only to save you from yourself. Only to keep you from becoming a murderer. <laughs> driver. Keep the change. Right. Uh, fine neighborhood, I must say. Sorry, I didn't pick it. Yeah, that's 218, the gray house. New Clark, I think we should have had that taxi wait. Chances mm-hmm. are we won't find a thing here, and we're just going to end oh, up with... Wait, Scott. What's the matter? Come on, quickly. Feel better now, Dr. Roebling? Oh, yes, thank you. Much better. Now, can you tell us what happened? Well, it's a long story. What it amounts to is that my nephew forced me to sign over all rights to my voice machine. He's on his way to Metropolis now with his wife, Cora. Where is the voice machine? In the basement of my home in Metropolis. Uh, How would your nephew and his wife be traveling? Well, they have a car. Do you know the color? The make? Now, Clark, is that necessary? Please, Lois. I, I believe it's a blue sedan, a Dodge. Uh, I don't suppose you know the license number. No, I don't. Okay, Lois. Yes? I'll go into town and send a cab back here. You and Dr. Roebling drive to the airport and take the first plane out to Metropolis. Well, now, don't leave him, not even for a minute. I'll meet you at his house in Metropolis. Why can't you take the plane with us? I've got to find that blue sedan. <laughs> You're driving too fast. You've got to get there, don't we? Well, you don't have to do anything. Oh, relax, Cora. We've got nothing to worry about from here on in. We'll have money to burn. We won't be able to burn it if you're dead. Dead? Ha! We're just beginning to live. You know what we're going to do first? We're going to take a trip. Jack, there's a man in the way. Oh, no! Oh, no! let him get out of the way. Jack, go, go! Get your head off my arm! You're killing me! Ah! Oh. Who are you? It's Sultan. Thanks for the recognition. I'll take those assignment papers in your jacket pocket, pal, if you don't mind. This is what you'll take. My, what a pretty automatic. Is it loaded? <laughs> Try again, but be careful when the bullets bounce back. Stop it, Jack. You can't hurt him. I'll hurt him. I'll kill him. That's enough target practice. First, I'll take the gun. No. Oh. Now the assignment papers. No, you'll never get them. Oh, won't I? Oh, please, please, don't, don't hurt him. Take the papers out of his pocket. Oh, no, no. Here. Thank you. Come on, back. You're mine. Believe me, if it wouldn't mean dragging your uncle's good name in the mud, I'd turn you over to the police and see to it that you got a couple of years behind bars to think it over. I'll give you nothing except a little warning. Get out of Metropolis and stay out. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Kent, for recovering those assignment papers. How did you possibly accomplish it? Yes, Mr. Kent, uh, how? Well, frankly, I... uh, Don't look at me like that, Lois. (laughs) Superman? Yes. He stopped their car on the road to Metropolis. Well... He let your nephew go, Dr. Roebling, out of consideration for you. I'm deeply grateful. Now, how about bringing me up to date on how this all got started? Well, Clark, Dr. Roebling told me the whole story. Let's not ask him to repeat it. All right. I'll give you a highlight. His nephew's wife, and incidentally their name is Roebling, too, and not Smith, met the doctor in Chicago and convinced him he had to travel to Metropolis incognito because someone was after the voice machine. Oh, so that's why you denied your identity in the dining car. Yes. It must have seemed very foolish to you. Not so much foolish as strange. Go ahead, Lois. The rest is simple. When Mrs. Roebling got the doctor into the compartment, she gave him what he thought was one of his stomach pills. 
Well, it was obviously something else because she remembers nothing at all until he woke up bound to a chair in the Marsden City rooming house. Miss Lane told you, I suppose, how they got you off the train and into an ambulance? Yes, it was all evidently carefully planned. If not for you, Mr. Kent and Miss Lane, 20 years of work would have gone for nothing. Well, I don't know about Mr. Kent, Dr. Robling, but there's one reward that I'm going to ask for. If it's within my power, you shall have it. I'd like to see your voice machine, and I'd like to hear it because, well, frankly, and please don't be hurt. Oh, not at all. I, I just don't believe that you can bring back the voices of the dead. Come, I'll show you. Oh, someone's at the door. Would you excuse me, please? Do you think you can actually do it, Carl? Well, we'll know in a few minutes. Cora Robling, his niece. Come on. Cora, what are you talking stop about? Him, stop him. Stop who? Jack, he's in the basement. He's going to smash your voice machine. Oh, oh, oh. How do I get to the basement, Doctor? Be- behind the stairs. There's a door. Right. right. So I'm afraid of you. No. Put that down. No. Oh, don't come near me. Oh, that you have this crowbar, too. I'll smash you like I smashed this machine. Mr. Kay, Rob, don't down his mouth. No, no. Drop that crowbar. I'll drop it on your head. No. Rob, you knocked him out. Why, I thought he was going to kill you with that crowbar. You're a brave man, Mr. Kane. But too late. Your voice machine is ruined. Can it be rebuilt? I'm afraid not in my lifetime. Oh. Someone else will have to carry on. What a shame. Well, the, the price of progress, Miss Lane, is often outrageously high. And man's avarice sometimes makes it higher. <laughs> I'll drop you off at your apartment, Lois. Ah, we certainly had an exciting night. We certainly have. And a puzzling one, too. Puzzling? Mm-hmm. Meaning what? Well, uh, when you ran down those steps to the basement... Yes? I followed you, Clark, and I stood at the head of the steps with Dr. Roebling. Well? Well, anyone could tell that his nephew was going to search, and yet you walked right toward him without even flinching. As though nothing could possibly happen to you. Not much could. Oh, no, not much at all. Just a split skull. And, you know... What? Well, I couldn't see your face, but from the back, as you walked across that basement, getting closer and closer to that lunatic with a crowbar in his hand, well, you looked like Superman. I did? I know it's silly, and I know I shouldn't be telling you this, because it's just going to give you a swelled head. Oh, not at all. I'm used to it by now. You're used to what? Being mistaken for Superman. Oh, In really? fact, if you promise to keep it quiet, I'll tell you a little secret. What? Some of my best friends can't tell us apart. And so ends The Voices of the Dead on The Adventures of Superman which come to you now each week at this same time over many of these same ABC stations. Listen again next week to another exciting Superman adventure. Superman is a copyrighted transcribed feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and brings you radio's most fabulous character in thrilling stories of action, mystery, and adventure. So be sure to listen when you hear the familiar cry, Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The role of Superman is played by Bud Collier. Lois Lane by Joan Alexander. Music is composed and played by John Garth. This is Jackson Beck reminding you to be sure to listen next week to The Adventures of Superman. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.